This special edition of Live and Local is coming to you live from the beautiful Bunker Hills Golf Course in Coon Rapids. Please join us as the Anoka Area Chamber of Commerce presents the annual State of the City's Luncheon. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the annual Anoka Area Chamber of Commerce State of the City's Luncheon, and happy Valentine's Day. So glad you spent it with us. And for those where this matters, this actually does count as I took you out deal. So I'm just saying that if tonight doesn't work out, hey, lunch was covered. Uh, welcome, and thank you. My name is Pete Turek, I'm president of the chamber, and what a great crowd, it's so great to have all of you guys back. Uh, you are about to find out what has is and will be happening in our region, and it's a lot. Uh, it's exciting stuff. We've also got this little project going you might have heard of called Highway 10 Construction. Uh, you will be getting an update on that as well. Uh, all of that coming up here in just a sec. First off, we've got a couple of luncheon sponsors that I wanna highlight. Chris Randall and the crew from First Bank Elk River. Chris, wave. Uh, well, that's kind of a weak wave. That's, uh, he is one of our luncheon sponsors. Chris, thank you, huge chamber supporter. And also want to uh, thank the crew from Killebrew Root Beer, our luncheon sponsors. We have table sponsors in the house, Alter Metal Recycling, uh, the city of Andover, the city of Anoka, city of Champlin, city of Coon Rapids, city of Ramsey, uh, Mercy Hospital and Line Health, and Zion Luther Church. Thank you to all of our table sponsors. A couple of items I want to touch before we get into our first presentation. On your table, there is this, and it talks about the chamber gala dinner. My wife is so ready for me to not be talking about the chamber gala dinner. This is our biggest luncheon of the year. That is our biggest event of the year. It's coming up on Friday, February 24th. We're out of the courtyards of Andover, and there are ways for you to participate. It is a fund Razor. So we uh, do that and a golf tournament to keep the mission that is the chamber going strong. Uh, we got over 330 people already attending the event. There is room for you, but ticket sales end at 9 a.m. on Monday. We have to do this thing with the Gala game. We have to get a program printed. So they will end at 9 a.m. on Monday. So if you'd like to attend, one ticket is 150 bucks, but that covers two people, full-blown meal, uh, you will win something um, as you are part of the Gala game, and we hope that you can attend. Also going on right now is the Chamber of Silent auction for that Gala dinner. Hence, that brings in this. There is stuff that you don't need but have to have online right now for you to bid on. It is through ClickBid, so it is safe and secure. You uh, just pull out your app on your phone to your QR code and it'll take you there. You can register, need not be present to win. We've got stuff for your home. We've got stuff for comfort. We've got uh, gift cards. We've got sports memorabilia. We have miscellaneous items. We have experiences. We have a ton of stuff that's up there. So many of you have donated and we appreciate that so much. There is still time to donate. In fact, uh, Darlene Song, who is the gala dinner committee chair, Ran up to plants and things and grabbed one of their rockers. It's a, is it 600 bucks? It's a $600 rocker that's about to go up onto that uh, bid site as soon as I get back there and do it. And we will be adding items all the way through the gala. So the silent auction will end at 8.45 on Friday, February 24th. Again, need not be present to win. You don't have to be there to pick it up. We will lug it all back to the office. You can come and pick it up. Or you can leave it like one guy did from two years ago, and I called him up, and I said, hey, you paid for it. And he goes, can I donate it back? And the answer was yes. And I also told him he could bid again, because if we could just keep that type of thing going, it would be good for everybody. So again, um, I, I urge you to uh, check out the silent auction. Uh, and if you want to come, I will put it on the line like I always do. Anybody who's ever coming, I know they're not going to. He always, it's the, well, if you don't like it, he'll refund your money. And I always say it, this is not your normal gala. Uh, we've all been to them where it's like, here, I'll give you my firstborn and all the money I have, can I just go home? That is not the chamber gala dinner. Ours is fast-paced. We move. 
the person who has the microphone wants to get home worse than you, that would be me. And so we keep it moving. Um, and seriously, talk to somebody who's been there and ask them if they had a good time, because I bet they did. So we urge you to come if you uh, would like to do that. With that said, it is now time to find out what is happening in our region. These are timed. I'm not going to tell you the mayor, but when we first did one of these a long time ago in my lifetime here at the chamber, the first mayor went 45 minutes. It was a, that luncheon still going on over at Greenhaven. Not anymore. We give them 10 minutes. They all know it. Tammy went from Lexica Communications, not only is wearing red, but she could be showing red. So if you're a presenter, you don't want to see red. She has a piece of paper with red on it. She'll show them one that says one minute, one that says 30 seconds, and then the dreaded red paper. So we will keep this moving. And as always, uh, our host city kicks it off, and we have Mayor Jerry Cook from Coon Rapids to kick it off. Jerry, thanks for having us. Thanks, Pete. And welcome to Coon Rapids. Welcome to our public golf course facility out here with uh, Kendall's Tavern and Chop House. I'm going to put that in there. Because i got two things I have to do with my hands. I can't hold a mic also. Um, and I've got a thing over there. I know where we're at. All right. Welcome to Coon Rapids. Coon Rapids continues to experience economic progress. We have new development going on. We issued $183 million in new construction permits last year. The constructions, the projects were a mix of commercial, residential, and industrial, and new development continues to add housing and business opportunities. In the, in the last 10 years, we've seen more than $1.4 billion of construction investment in our city. Among the new development are several new businesses. We have a new retail building was constructed at the former, and I like, they always say the former Golden Corral site. It was Golden Corral for like 10 minutes. It was, it was Old Country Buffet for a long time prior to that. But it's the visible corner at Main Street and Round Lake and uh, Chapter Aesthetic Studios, Cafe Zupas, and Mod Pizza are either opening or open there. Another busy intersection at Hanson and Northdale got a new Shine Car Wash. There we go. Uh, many more new businesses opened or prepared to open in Coon Rapids. Uh, along Highway 10 and Gateway there, we have Walzer Hyundai dealership off Highway 10. Schneiderman's Furniture opened at the former Sears site, and that was a really nice upgrade. Also in Riverdale Village, we gained the Joint Chiropractic Burlington and Sierra Trading Post. Many others are in the works, including Amazon Fresh. Who knows if they're ever coming? They, they've got the keys to the building, but they're apparently pumping the brakes on that business model. Um, other development around the city include a large new industrial uh, complex being constructed on 7.7 .7 acres by Scannell Properties. It's more than 120,000 square feet of space near East River Road and 610. Uh, federal premium ammunitions began a large expansion with the construction of Vista Outdoors another 100,000 square foot warehouse. And that's, I believe, their first construction in Coon Rapids. Um, well, everything else they've got going is over in, you know, Anoka. We also had a new school opened in 2022, Paladin Career and Technical High School, which focuses on trades and vocational skills. And if you ever get a chance, tour it. It is an amazing opportunity for students. It's right behind the uh, Coon Rapids Post Office. Uh, the city took on some construction of our own. Here we go. Uh, we did the groundbreaking in June for a new fire station. Um, construction is well underway and should be completed this upcoming summer. And I, and I wish we could get a little closer on this, and I wish, wish Matt Stamweddle was here. Because when you look at all the people with the shovels, you'll see everybody is holding a shovel exactly the same way except the hockey player on the end. Matt. All right. And then uh, it's planned to be open in time for our 4th of July celebration as we plan on launching the fireworks from the roof of the new building. Come on, there we go. Um, the new fire station is at Mississippi Boulevard and 111th Avenue, directly across from Anoka Ramsey Community College. It's a 32,000 square foot building. 
It includes apparatus bays, administrative offices, a training room, lots of storage, and a control room and hose tower on the third floor. We've got a lot of public safety initiatives going on. We've got big changes in our police department. We named John Stanky as our new police chief this past summer. And just this week, John celebrated 30 years with the city of Coon Rapids. So he's been with us right from the very beginning as far as his career, community service officer, um, reserve, all of that, right? Yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking to our retired cop over here for the nod. All right. He has launched a variety of new public safety initiatives. The Multicultural Advisory Committee continues to grow. Um, police also introduced the bike rodeo again, which we haven't had in the city for decades. We brought back the Community Police Academy, which was paused uh, during the pandemic. And staff developed the brand new pep talk program where Coon Rapids, Coon Rapids police are passionate about public education and crime prevention. So if folks want to learn about important public safety topics, they can schedule a pep talk. You can choose from a menu of more than a dozen topics that include CPR, AED training, avoiding scams, bicycle safety, retail, commercial security, um, all great, timely, and interesting topics. And most pep, pep talks are about an hour long and will be tailored to the group. Um, uh, we have some sustainability initiatives in 2022. Green Homes is an energy efficiency incentive program designed to help own homeowners find ways to save energy and save money. The program offers discounts on home energy audits in partnership with utility companies, um, and the city offers additional rebates to homeowners who implement certain updates. For example, installing an energy-efficient furnace, and I think she put that on there only because I just did that, and I just got my $200 rebate, so it's a beautiful thing. Uh, we still have our front door program, which is really an incredibly popular program. We received nearly 350 applications last year, and we were able to help homeowners complete 72 grants. Um, it was a difficult year, though, and we found some applicants chose to withdraw due to increased material costs and delays and probably interest rates. Uh, but overall, it was another robust year as the program garnered $1.32 million in increased curb appeal. And that's the thing with Front Door. It's, it's exactly as it sounds. It's whatever will appeal or the increase the curb appeal of the home. Um, and demand continues for many of our other housing incentive programs. The Front Door grant, uh, nope, hang on. Here's a great sample from 20,000 or 2022. I guess I got behind. Um, here's a before and after from our Front Door program. Uh, new front door and garage door, beautiful stonework and paver style driveway. This type of beautification improvements allow homeowners to maximize their grant opportunity. And the front door program will pay a portion of the project up to $5,000. And basic projects garner a 15% grant. Beautification projects like this stone and driveway qualify for a 25% grant. And then our other program that's still very popular is Home for Generations 2. It continues to successfully encourage large private investment. It's a great way to revitalize our aging housing stock. And throughout the life of this program, Home for Generations has garnered more than $15.8 million worth of investment since 2013. Here's a sample of that. This is the Wilson's family home before and after. They put on a huge addition on the back of their home, which sits on Crooked Lake. So when you're on a waterfront, I would consider that the front of the home. Wouldn't you, Commissioner, or Mayor Sabus? The project included new bedrooms, a very unique bathroom addition, an outdoor fireplace, and additional living space. And they were one of the families featured in a special video program we produced in 2022. We created a virtual home remodeling tour. Normally we would have gone through the homes, but we were still sort of uh, gun-shy from the pandemic. So we did a virtual, um, and this QR code could be scanned actually with your phone's camera, and you could actually watch the YouTube video because we're not going to show it here now. The program features several home remodeling projects in the city last year, and there are also interviews with homeowners, local contractors, and city staff. Uh, we have a lot of new housing construction continuing. Even as a nearly fully developed city, we had 43 new single-family homes built in Coon Rapids in 2022. And part of that new construction continues to uh, happen down in Port Riverwalk development area. 
Cooner Rapids Bay Center Homes continued construction at Port Riverwalk, which began in 2020. In all, there will be 136 one-level and two-level townhomes. Additional townhome development is planned throughout the city, including a 31-unit townhome development by Mary T. Incorporated. And we have more multifamily housing underway. Several market rate apartment projects moved forward. Riverdale Station entered phase three last year with the construction of 192 market rate apartments. This is adjacent to the Lyra and Nova buildings, not far from Target and the North Star Station. Phase four is yet to come, and that will include an 81-unit affordable senior housing complex. Meanwhile, the Golden Aspen Flats is another multi-phase apartment project. That's over right next to that new school and behind the post office. Construction began last year on the first phase of the 150-unit market rate apartment complex. Um, this is a big one here. The 610 interchange project at East River Road took a step forward. Um, after city staff and the public overwhelming preferred a northeast loop design. So this will actually give Coon Rapids east and west connections on 610. Were you counting the time that I introduced? Welcome them to the... Really? No kidding? All right. So then we'll skip ahead from 610, which is a very important project, even though we're going to move on now, uh, to our Safe rules, safe Routes to School grant for Coon Rapids High School. They've done the same crossover at uh, North Hill High School since it opened in 1964. It's time to update that a little bit. And then finally, many community events. We had a great community event every month last year in 2022. And um, so, yeah, great to come together. Thank you all. Thank you, Jerry. Next up, let's find out what's happening in Andover. To give the presentation, it's Community uh, Development Director Joe Janik. Thank you. Yep, I was just making sure that we were switching here. All right, so uh, in 2023, we did have a new council member that uh, joined us. It's Rick Englehart. As we take a look at uh, some development in our community, if we focus at 7th and Bunker Lake Boulevard, we have some projects that are going on. You may have noticed some of the larger structures there. There is a 150-unit market-rate apartment building that's being constructed. It will provide for studios, one-bedroom, and two-bedroom apartments there. There's also a fitness center, a uh, dog wash, a dog park, and there's storage lockers and underground parking that's provided within that structure. We also have a 32-unit memory care building. Uh, there'll be assisted living as well as the memory care that'll occur there. There is a Taco Bell that's been started uh, next month or late this month. There'll be some parts of the building that will be sent over there, so you'll start to see it being constructed. And also, the many of you may have noticed the new signal that went in. Uh, that was a project with working with the city of Anoka, Anoka County, and the developer to have that put in place. There continues to be some additional commercial spaces out there for your business. Also, the city council just recently approved two new drive throughs uh, off of Bunker Lake Boulevard next to the festival in the Target area. So we are expecting in 2023 to see a Noodles and & Company and a Chipotle coming in on these parcels. Our residential has been relatively strong over the last several years. We've seen both urban and rural development occur in our community. Lennar has been moving forward with a 383-unit residential um, project. They approved 66 lots in the first phase, and now the council just recently approved 36 villa lots on the west side of Prairie Road. Something to keep in mind, uh, which I'll touch on in a, a second here, but we'll talk a little bit about some traffic. Meadows at Peterson Farms is a rural development. They, over the first two phases, there were 70 home sites that were provided for, and they are looking at trying to provide for another 36 homes that could go out there. They're currently working through the development process for the project. This just shows some of the different residential developments that are available in our community. Uh, during 2022, we've had several that uh, were constructed. We have Oakview Acres, Nightingale Villas, Andover Village, Meadows at Nightingale, Shadowbrook North. So there's quite a few uh, sites for you to locate. 
As we take a look at our 2023 mill and overlay program, uh, it's a, one of the largest projects that the city of Andover has um, participated in, roughly, or actually just over 16 miles of roadway, whether that's a full recon to a mill and overlay. And if we go back to 2020, and including these 2023 projects, the city council will have uh, done some sort of work to roughly 20% of the roadways in the community. So they've taken a, a large step forward in maintaining the roadways that we have. Something that Andover doesn't have currently is a roundabout. However, over the next four years, we will have four. So we've got uh, this Prairie Road Northwest and 151st Lane Northwest. This is something that Lunar will be constructing as they move forward with their second edition. Crestone Boulevard and Nightingale, that would be a county project. And just to the north of that, Nightingale Street and Veterans Memorial Drive will also receive a roundabout. And then in 2026, 2027 timeframe, uh, 7th Avenue up by the Meadows at Peterson Farms or 165th Avenue, they'll have a roundabout constructed there as well. One of the large legislative priorities of the community has been the Red Oaks neighborhood groundwater contamination. So right now in this, on this map here, there's roughly actually just a few homes over 50 that are receiving bottled water. And the city has been working with the MPCA, EPA, and state legislators to receive bonding to provide for city water and connections to the neighborhood. Uh, it is a, a high priority of the community, and we'd like to see that funded and constructed. Redevelopment opportunities, this is something that uh, if you've been coming here over the years, you may have noticed that we've been treating this as a marathon versus a, a sprint. Uh, last year, we did acquire an additional duplex, and we also removed two buildings in late December. So the, the red parcels on the map are the ones that the buildings have been removed. The yellow ones, we still have occupants, or they're still uh, existing units there. Our city council and our residents have a uh, strong desire to keep our park system operational and functional, and they take pride in what they have. So our council and our public works crews, parks crews, certainly take pride, and they invest money in keeping and maintaining what we have. Due to a uh, resident's generous donation, the city of Andover was able to acquire the two statues you hear, see here for our Veterans Memorial dedication. Uh, the Slyzik family gener generously donated uh, a significant amount of money for that. Uh, it was a very well attended event and the city certainly takes pride in honoring our veterans. Our community center, uh, it still sees some of the, I'll call it fallout from the COVID. So our, our numbers aren't quite as high as what they have been in the past. But typically we see somewhere between half a million to a million people will travel through the community center and the Y that's located there. Something that did occur at our community center, perhaps you may have been there or watched it on TV, November 7th, 2022, we were able to host the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame Museum Women's Face-Off. Uh, if you're wondering, St. Cloud did win. Uh, it raises awareness for the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame Museum in Eveleth. Another event that occurs at our community center on a yearly basis is the North Suburban Home Show, which is slated for Saturday. March 11th this year. It's uh, sponsored by the Anoka Area Chamber of Commerce, City of Anoka, City of um, Coon Rapids, and also the City of Andover. If you're interested, we have our Andover Family Fun Fest in July 2023, and hopefully you can attend. Thank you. Joe, thank you. So somebody asked me, how do you come up with an order? of who gets to go because why is my city not like higher up? This is all about PowerPoints, people. Um, we work with Catherine Lennenberg and the crew at QCTV and they put them all together. This guy is so important right now. And it's, we throw it out to the cities and as they come in, that's how they get slotted. So hence why my home city of Champlin is third. Ashley yeah, will change that next year. Um, and so it's time to find out what is happening there. And next up is Mayor Ryan Sabus from Champ. All right, welcome to Champlin State of the City. My name is Ryan Sabus, and I'm the newly elected mayor to Champlin. 
Upon assuming the office of mayor, I vacated my Ward 4 seat, and the City Council is appointing our future Ward 4 councilman who's sitting at our table right now, Tim LaCroix, at our next council meeting. We have a veteran group of leaders on the Champlain City Council. Jessica Tesdall and Tom Moe were both recently re-elected to the City Council, and Nate Truesdale is my newly elected, or newly appointed acting mayor. Looking back at 2022, our biggest milestone was the grand opening of the Mississippi Crossings, a redevelopment project that has been 20 plus years in the making with a focus on activating the riverfront and creating a gathering space in Champlain. As you can see, that was our former mayor, Ryan Karasik, opening up, uh, let's see here, here we go, opening up the ribbon cutting for the crossings. It was a great event. Uh, it was an incredible honor to clip the ribbon with so many former mayors involved and council members who helped make this 20-year dream of activating the riverfront a reality in Champlain. The showcase event was a chance for residents to tour our new event center, experience the plaza amenities, and enjoy live music in the outdoor performance area. Let's take a look. So that is Anderson Daniels, our hometown celebrity singing Town Like This, a song he wrote about Champlain. He was the first to rock the river on the Mississippi crossings, and we are looking forward to hosting many more musicians as we kick off our free summer concert series this year. We also showcased our new Mississippi crossings event, available to reserve for any occasion. You can rent individual rooms by the hour or the full facility all day. We are excited to finally have a place to gather in the heart of Champlain. Upon entry, the lobby features a warm fireplace, welcome to welcome and offers a unique sliding glass door entryway to the main banquet room, which can accommodate a closed or open floor plan. The main banquet room inside the event center is available to reserve by the hour as well or all day. This can seat up to 140 and feature an outdoor deck and a full service catering kitchen. Also inside the event center is a conference room that's available to rent by the hour as well. You can elevate any meeting or team building event by using this high tech space that accommodates up to 20 people. As you can see here, the view from the event center deck is absolutely stunning. It overlooks the Mississippi River, public docks, playground, and outdoor performance area. If you have an event in mind, I encourage you to discover your destination by visiting mississippicrossings.com. You'll find floor plans, preferred vendors, frequently asked questions, and more. Book, at M book the MCEC, and I guarantee your guests will be wowed. Between the event center and outdoor performance area is the plaza. It consists of a new playground, fire pits, and green space for recreational lawn games at the Mississippi Crossings. And still to, go, still to come, and probably our most awaited prize in the event center will be a multi-level restaurant, which will break ground adjacent to the stage. It will include a large patio, a rooftop bar to provide an outdoor riverfront dining and live music experience on summer nights when concerts are hosted in the outdoor performance area. Also still to come, we have a deli that will break ground in the front of the Bowline apartment complex and specialize in grab-and-go items like sandwiches, soups, salads, coffee, and bakery items. And if you or anyone you know is interested in bringing your business to the Mississippi Crossings area, we have some shovel-ready shovel sites available. I encourage interested parties to talk to our community development director about any of these real estate opportunities. Looking ahead to 2023, as part of an historical bold initiative to preserve the safety of our community, the Champlain Council unanimously decided to add three officers to support an ongoing commitment to stay tough on crime. The additional 
The addition of three new officers will bolster a citywide coverage by increasing the minimum on-duty patrol officers from two to three per shift. Our police department has been staffed with 27 officers since the 90s, and therefore the city council placed public safety at the forefront of this year's budget priorities. Our vision is a safe and thriving community. Our mission is to provide stability and security. Nearly one-third of our new initiatives this year were dedicated to public safety, and half of the general operating levy increase will be used to address ongoing staffing and supportive service needs in our police department. Additional initiatives for the 2023 include growing community engagement through annual events like our Father Hennepin Days Festival, our annual Summer Carnival, Shed Fest, our annual Fall Rock Show, and our Christmas at the Crossings, our new December tree lighting celebration. We'd love to see you visit Champlin to attend any of these amazing events in the year ahead. Thank you for your time. All right, on deck, Ramsey. Up now is Anoka. City Council Member Eric Skoquist will give the presentation. Well, thank you everybody for coming today. My name's Eric Skoquist. I'm a city council member in Anoka. Did I get a woo in the back? Thank you. Woohoo. Um, first thing, I just want to hit on a couple of development highlights here. So if you drive through Anoka, you've been noticing a lot of action has been happening at 7th and Main Street. Uh, one of the corners where the former Hardee's was will be a multi-tenant retail commercial space with a couple drive drive-bys, or drive throughs excuse me. And uh, all right. Got my gaff for the day, right? <clears throat> anyway, a uh, couple drive throughs So this will be a really good hybrid between kind of going from downtown to Noka and then to the east by Riverdale over there. So looking forward to that, and that should be open this summer. Also here we have uh, the American Cooperative. This is a senior co-op uh, on our historic Greenhaven golf course. So that opened last month, uh, and it's a great, great asset. We're trying to be uh, use that resource we have as a city golf course a lot more efficiently. And... One of the cool things I liked about this is not only does it take advantage of the golf course, but there's even golf cart parking for the residents there, so they can just cruise right over to that city resource and, and enjoy it and spend a little money. So, A um, couple other things uh, in our rail village, we've been having activity for a while now too. So there's David Weekly townhomes, uh, there's two three-level townhomes in that area, uh, and I've heard from a lot of folks they love it because it's a rail village but is maybe not even a mile from our downtown along the Rum River. Um, and there's a great Rum River Regional Trail that connects people from to the south to downtown Anoka and along the Rum River into points north into some of our neighbors, Ramsey and Andover and other things as well. Also, there's some activity happening if you go down Grant Street. There's some foundations for a new Phase 3 of Volunteers of America, a senior living facility. This is more your entry-level uh, kind of affordable senior housing. And so once this is constructed, you can go everywhere from that to assisted living and independent to nursing home all at the same location. So this has been a project going on for many years, uh, and it's just trucking right along. One other thing, I, excuse me, I want to touch on here is um, the Curb Appeal Residential Enhancement Program, or CARES program. This is very similar to what Mayor uh, Cook talked about in the city of Coon Rapids, where we're using some of our city resources to leverage a lot of private investment in curb appeal in our neighborhoods. We all know Anoka and a lot of the other communities are older communities, and a lot of times some of these programs that we have, low interest loans and other things, they're great, but they're not as utilized. And so this was a, I, I really want to say kudos to Coon Rapids for not only creating this model, but for your staff for working with ours to get this off the ground. And, and it's great when you have more applicants than you have folks that are uh, going to go into the program. So hopefully we'll get some more money into this and just keep uh, trucking along. Not the most exciting thing in the world to talk about, but uh, we have a street renewal program in the city of Anoka we've had for 24 years. And this is not only street surfaces, but you got to think about the pipes and the infrastructure underneath. And so uh, we've been doing this for 20, uh, 24 years now. Uh, the next two years, we're going to spend $5.7 million redoing the area around Franklin School. It's the northwest corner of uh, Main Street and Ferry Street. And for those that aren't into that, you know, haven't been having to do a lot of that. When your infrastructure is getting 70 years old underneath, you, that's a big expense. I think the, the bills are probably three times more than they were maybe five years ago. So plan on this, think about it, because it sneaks up on you, and uh, it's, it's very expensive. But it's important, and that's what people expect our cities to do. 
Another public improvement project here, we have the uh, Rum River Stabilization. So we have two rivers through Anoka, the Mississippi and the Rum River. We try to work really closely with the Anoka Conservation District, and they were uh, instrumental in helping us get $1.1 million uh, to help shore up this eroding river bank. Uh, this is right in the Rum River near downtown Anoka below the Woodbury House. That's the big white house with the stone fence when you go over to Champlin. And so it's important that we protect not only the historic asset that predates the state of Minnesota, uh, but it also reduces sediment into our river and helps keep our navigation channel open so that Mayor Cook can take his boat up uh, and spend money downtown Anoka. <coughs> also here, we, uh, an investment we had is I, I touched on the uh, cooperative along the golf course. Well, what was there prior was a lot of the city's um, our shooting range, dog pound, uh, those types of things as well. And so we had to relocate some of those. So near our fire station and our police station is our law enforcement training center and animal containment facility. So on that left side, that's from the 3rd Avenue level. It's actually a two-level facility built into a hill. And that's for CSOs, for parking, for uh, the kennels, and a little bit of an outdoor run. And so that has been opened up, and it's been, it's been very nice for us. Um, and so... Uh, I'm sure you can talk with, with our department if, if that's something you have interest in or if there's other issues with your animal containment. Uh, we felt that this was important for the city of Minoka, for our residents. They've expected it for many years, and, and we wanted to keep that going. The other part that's great is if you see in the lower right, the whole lower level is the Law Enforcement Training Center. What this is, it's kind of a two-pronged thing. There's a 50-yard indoor range that can be used for rifle training and certification. Uh, as well as in the picture, you'll see there's a kind of a wraparound simulator for our, our law enforcement individuals. And so it's a, really a state-of-the-art facility that we have uh, in the city of Anoka right here. And if you have interest, any of you that have law enforcement or folks from the sheriff's office or anybody else, share this because we view this not just as a city of Anoka asset, but this is really a community asset that we're willing to allow other people to come in and, and utilize. So uh, just keep that in mind. Another thing is a Greenhaven golf course I touched on. This has been something we've had in the city since the 30s. Uh, but we're always trying to be efficient with our resources and come up with new ways to utilize that. And so in the city of Anoka here, what we've tried to do is try to get it in the off season. What can we do at different times of the year when there's not as much activity? And we do, we do cross country skiing. We have groomed trails. We had a high school event out there yesterday. Um, simulators we've had for a few years now, and those have proven to be very successful. Uh, but one thing we added was the Cedars at Greenhaven. It's a disc golf course we set up just for the winter time, and that's been hugely successful. A lot of people coming out, enjoying the golf course in the off year, uh, and then they come in and they, you know, they warm up, they get something to eat, or and, and it's been great. And it, not only does it just provide revenue for our restaurant, but it gives people exposure to something they didn't know was there, and so they can come back in the summer or for some other activities. So just being smart about what we have in the in the city and trying to use it as as much as possible. Also in NOCO, I, I probably have more events than I could list. I could go on for 45 minutes talking about that, uh, Pete, so I won't do that. But one thing that we did change this year is we've had the uh, annual Christmas tree lighting for, for many years. Now we added an Artisan Delights Market at Historic Mill Site in the city of Anoka, a great uh, event venue where they fixed up a historic print shop. Uh, but trying to have lo play for local artists, just kind of layer, add, keep adding layers and layers to these events at any given time, and it makes it more appealing for more folks gets more people in the city and um, I'll just like to say I you see that picture at the fireworks that uh, Mayor Cook was talking about it they, they totally stole that from us but it's okay because we stole the uh, curb appeal program from them and and you know friendly rivalries are great but that's why I love about this stuff because we can learn what other people are doing we can we can build on that success and our borders don't just stop because there's some line on a piece of paper people live in all of our communities and so with that, um, getting into Anoka is important as well. We're older city, it's kind of a hub, so you know, I won't get into Highway 10 because that'll, that'll be done later. But there's other ways to get into town. Uh, we have a couple of rivers. We try to do what we can to make sure people come on their boats from, from the south uh, or from the north. We have a snowmobile corral set up in the winter. I've seen folks come in from Ramsey and points north, and they stop in Anoka and have their bike to eat. Um, with a permit, you can, you can have your UTV and your golf cart in, in the city. And we're also just looking at other ways to just make, uh, address multimodal transportation. There's a lot more. We've all seen more e-scooters and, and bikes and things cruising around. So uh, trying to figure out ways to create better trail connections, uh, striping maybe on the roads. 
and not just doing it within our city, but I really want a goal to be able to work with some of our neighboring cities because there's a lot of folks, they like to cruise around uh, maybe a mile or two and, and they could go to Riverdale. They could go across to that great development in Champlin that's over there and those folks can come to us. So trying to work together I think is really important because people love living in this area and no matter which city they're in, they should have the opportunity to enjoy everything. Final thing I'll touch on is the uh, uh, social district concept. And some of you maybe have heard about this, but this is actually, uh, there was a law passed last session in the liquor bill that allowed the city of Anoka to have a social district. And this is similar, if you've traveled around, you've probably gone to other cities where you can have a beverage uh, in a licensed restaurant, bring it outside within this certain district and zone, mill around, go to the park, you know, all those types of things. So that's something we have, uh, the legislature gave us basically a two-year window to create this and to report back to them. And so that's something we're looking at. We're, um, you know, trying to work with all the stakeholders in the area. We want to make sure that we do this right. And I think probably what we'll do is we're going we're gonna to dip our toe in the water a little bit, maybe go for more of some special events and times. Uh, but we want to make sure that this is done right, and, and hopefully this can be a model that goes forward to other cities as well. But stay, stay tuned to that one for a little bit more. But with that, I just uh, want to thank you for coming out and encourage you to swing into Anoka at any time. We love to have visitors, and we'd love to see you there. I was at a recent City of Ramsey event um, where they invited the business community out to give an update about what is happening, and there is a lot happening in Ramsey. And to give you that update, we have Mayor Pro Tem Chris Riley. All right, well, like you said, I'm Chris Riley. I'm council member at large for the city of Ramsey. Um, the acting mayor, Mayor Kuzma, is not able to make it. I've been telling people it's a skateboarding accident. It really isn't. <clears throat> See, technology here. Uh, city of Ramsey's mission statement is to work together to responsibly grow our community and provide quality, cost-effective government services. Our city council, boards, commissions, and staff take these words to heart. Even if a few people on Facebook do not always agree with our great accolades. I hate Facebook. It's a scourge on, on our, our society now. So one of our objectives is to stri strive toward financial stability. The city's tax rate decreased from 42.238 last year to 40.537. This is due to a 26% increase in tax capacity, um, all having to do with market increase. We've all enjoyed the same thing. Uh, we have issued in the city $10.765 million of GO street reconstruction bonds. Um, I'm going to be talking about infrastructure a fair amount. Uh, Council Member Skokwis said it wasn't exciting, but we're excited about doing it. Uh, our city council wants to see our streets improved, and this bonding is going to help us get a lot more done and a lot faster. Uh, our S&P rating was reaffirmed at AA plus for 2022. Look at that picture. All right. Another objective is balancing our rural character and urban growth. Um, our growth has continued, and our rooftops and retail for 2022, we have added 90 single-family homes, 36 units of multifamily housing. Uh, this added a value of $35.7 million. Six new commercial permits with a valuation of $33.8 million. And now we currently have a 598 businesses that call Ramsey home. And these businesses employ 7,235 people. I'm excited to see that number grow. Uh, we've added 15,000 square feet of retail space. This included Gigi's Salon and Spa with a new building and an O'Reilly's uh, Auto Parts, no relation. 7,200 square feet of retail center is under construction and a 16,000 square foot childcare facility will be starting in spring. We have several new industrial developments that are uh, flourishing. Uh, very large, Oppidan and Anderson Deline has built 323,000 square feet. That was completed in 2022. 
and currently under under construction is $147,000 uh, square feet more for Oppidan and $84,000 uh, square feet uh, of, in a concept stage for PSD, one of our local Ramsey businesses. As part of our new development, there's always some impacts on our natural resources. Uh, the city of Ramsey has been working hard to balance this. A couple examples, uh, Ramsey has continued its status as a, as a tree city, USA city. This marks the 31st year in a row of that. And we also work to support residents and businesses regarding various diseases and insect threats, such as oak wilt and emerald ash borer, which emerald ash borer is hitting our city hard. We are proud to be an active and connected community. In 2022, the city continued preparing for the improvements to Highway 10. So I'm going to touch on that because it's important to us. So we are furthering the Ramsey Gateway Project. So other cities named their part, so now we've named our part just to keep up. The project will remove the last two signalized intersections on Highway 10. So we'll be removing Sunfish Lake Boulevard and Ramsey Boulevards. And not only will, will there be overpasses over the highway, but this will also include overpasses over the railroad tracks. So making things faster, more efficient, and increasing our safety. Construction activities will begin this summer. This is going to really include utility relocation, reconstructing Riverdale Drive east of Sunfish Lake, and temporarily widening Highway 10 to allow for two lanes of traffic in each direction during construction. I'll repeat that, two lanes of traffic in each direction during construction. I think that's gonna be a really big benefit. Uh, majority of the work through Ramsey on Highway 10 is gonna ha happen in 2024 and 2025. Final touches to the project will be in 2026. This project is fully funded, so it is moving forward. The city is further committed to providing a safe and sustainable drinking water supply for municipal users. Again, more infrastructure here. This is important for our city. We are constructing a 10 million gallon per day water treatment facility. Ramsey hasn't had one in the past, and now we're moving forward with that. The plant is designed to remove iron and manganese. Who knew manganese was a problem until they made it a problem, but we're removing it now. Um, plans are currently out for bids, um, and on March 28th, the City Council is going to consider accepting these bids. Uh, assuming the contract is awarded, con uh, construction will start in the spring, and our plant will be operational in the summer of 2025. More infrastructure. So I touched on the GO bonds the city's doing. So. We are committed to maintaining our 185 miles of city street, and we are using our pavement management program. We're going to be spending $12 million over the next 10 years in addition to the bonds. Uh, we have created a 10-year capital improvement plan that includes over 45 miles of street reconstruction projects and 36 miles of pavement overlay pro programs. That means we're going to be working on 45% of our city streets within the next 10 years. Um, it's a huge portion, but it really needs to be done. Uh, we fell behind. Now we're making a big swing at getting caught up. Aside from these uh, improvements, our priority and intention is to foster social, so social connections through recreational opportunities. We are proud to provide access to our natural resources through canoe and kayak rentals, especially to our lakes and rivers. Ramsey has a variety of recreational opportunities through the fabulous parks, park facilities, and trail access. We also connect our residents to the natural world through gardening, pollinator protection, and recreational programs such as bird watching, snowshoeing, art, concerts in the park, and much more. Public safety. So in Ramsey, we strive to have a smart, citizen-focused government. Our residents' our residents' well-being and safety are high priority. Both our police and fire departments see a high volume of calls. Our police department responded to 15,600 calls, a slight decrease from their all-time record in 2021. 
The fire department responded to 1,381 calls for service. This was a 10% increase over the prior year. The fire department has implemented a duty crew model. This helps to continue to decrease our response times and provide more timely service to our residents and um, businesses in emergency time. Ramsey continues to have a low crime rate. Yay. And uh, with uh, property crimes and theft as our most significant, um, a majority of our service calls are non-criminal. So that's an important, I'm telling you how many calls there are, but mostly of them aren't that important. Um, as far as like, you know, criminal activities, we're no drive-bys. See, we're bringing it back. <laughs> um, the police department is looking forward to hiring three officers in 2023 to be at our complete staffing levels. Recruiting and retaining officers is an ongoing challenge for the city of Ramsey police department and the profession in general. I'm sure none of you have ran into these problems. In 2022, the police department began implementing body-worn cameras for all officers. The majority, the major project will continue in 2023. The city council has supported this tool to protect the officers and the public in their interactions. Both departments are involved in uh, citizen engagement throughout the year and participate in Happy Days, Citizen Academy, trick-or-treating, coffee with the cop, and demonstrations of vehicles, just to name a few. We now have a new polling location. And that's going to help us uh, be more efficient. And uh, we have a brand new city administrator. Everybody say hi to Brian Hagen. Thank you. All right, next up, Oak Grove. Oh, they're, they're about to get busy. You finish Highway 10, you get rid of those lights, and look out, because I see this expansion running from 10 all the way up to the north. And with us from Oak Grove is Mayor Weston Rolfe. All right, well, hello. Uh, like you said, I'm uh, Weston Rolfe, the new mayor of Oak Grove. Um, we got a lot of good things going on up there. I'll be honest, listening to all of these, uh, I, I think what you're doing in a year, I don't know if we've done it in 25 years. Uh, but we are moving forward with a few things here. Um, first of all, like I said, I'm the new mayor. We do have three council members uh, that have a lot of experience. Uh, the bottom one, Angie Bray Johnson, she's new. Um, she's definitely figuring it out. Uh, we definitely are uh, business friendly city, even though we don't have a lot. Uh, we try to do a lot of things to kind of help the businesses. One of them happens to be a local business directory. What we do is we put businesses that are interested on our actual city website. So that helps the residents in our city know what businesses we have. Because we do have a lot of businesses, uh, you know, at uh, people's homes, uh, accessory buildings, so on and so forth. I happen to be one of them. So. It's good for the community to know who's in the city. This is just an example of the website that shows the list of businesses. It has a link to like their website and so forth. If anybody from Oak Grove, even if it's a home-based business, wants to be added, uh, just go to our website. There's a quick little form you can fill out, very easy. Uh, we do try and advertise this as often as we can, even in our city newsletter and so forth, again, to try to help support uh, the businesses that we have. We also recently started in the last year or so of allowing businesses to advertise in the city newsletter. Uh, I think it's actually kind of a win-win. It helps uh, the expense of the city newsletter, and it also gets the businesses in our community's name out there again. And we've had a lot of success with it. In fact, I think there's more businesses that want to do it than we have room for. Uh, so it's definitely been a good thing. Again, if you are a business in Oak Grove, certainly get a hold of our city administrator. Again, it's quarterly. And it's pretty, uh, pretty inexpensive. We don't have a lot of growth in our city relating to new businesses and industrial and so forth, but we do have the Rademacher Company's corporate headquarters being built on County Road 7 and Highway 22. 
Everybody thinks it's just a gas station. Looks like the biggest gas station you've ever seen, which I do have a picture for it coming soon. Uh, we also have Vizu Sewer that's being built on County Road 22 in Tamarack, if you know where that is, kind of by the railroad tracks. So it's our industrial area. We still have a couple more lots in there. Uh, if you're interested, you can, another thing, you can contact the city administrator. Kind of the go-to guy here. Uh, the city has a lot for sale. If you know where uh, County Road 9 and uh, County Road 22 um, it's by like the speedway just behind it. It's about a two acre parcel that we're looking to sell to somebody, uh, some type of retail uh, or office type space. Uh, it's, a, it's a great location if you're looking. In the next photo, this is the new Bill Superette headquarters. As you can see again, it looks uh, huge and it is, uh, but we're excited to have uh, the Bill Superette and G Will Liquor, obviously it's one company, uh, to be building in our city. Uh, we're definitely proud of that. Uh, again, that's in the area there of County Road 7 and 22. We have, well, as becoming first mayor, this is probably the hardest thing to deal with, but we have now been told we have our first roundabout coming to our city. Um, I've had lots of hate mail, uh, phone calls, and I do support it. I think it's actually a good thing, but that's right by that Bill's new headquarter there. Again, it's 7 and 22. And just east of it, you can kind of see where the Rum River goes. We have a bridge there uh, that's going to be replaced this uh, next summer as well. So we'll be doing a roundabout and a new bridge all at the same time. Um, the good news is the county has reassured us that there will be at least one lane of traffic going both ways the entire time. So without that, it would be 11-mile detour. So we're excited about that. As you can see here, that's a photo of the roundabout. Um, and the next photo is the bridge. Uh, for those snowmobilers in the room that happen to come up our way, uh, they're actually adding a trail onto the bridge for snowmobiles. Um, kind of look at that thinking right now that serves a good purpose, but you know, 20, 30 years down the road, whatever it happens to be, that they need to widen uh, County Road 22, the bridge would actually be wide enough to go from two lanes to four lanes. So they're, they're thinking ahead. Uh, we've had, since 2020, 161 homes built in our city, which I think, honestly, is a lot for our city. Uh, we still are doing two-and-a-half-acre parcels, which is what we're going to continue doing as long as I have anything to say about it. Uh, we've, uh, we're also working with the county um, to continue to improve all the roads as more and more houses are being built. Uh, even though we you know, have 161 in our city, St. Francis and northern cities, ahead of us are building a lot more, which creates obviously a lot of additional traffic for, for all of us here. Uh, those are some of the subdivision names there. Uh, some of them haven't even been started yet. Most of them have quite a few houses being built within them, and some of them are probably actually uh, pretty full at this point. Uh, what we added, I don't know if you guys, any other cities ever have, but we didn't have any type of a sledding hill. You had to go all the way down to Prairie Knoll and Andover to do any type of sledding. So we actually uh, constructed our own about a year and a half ago, and it's been really successful. Um, you'll see there's also some uh, uh, hiking trails. Uh, I was a little skeptical about the hiking trails um, when I was on the council before. I didn't think anybody would ever use them. I figure we all have big lots. Why would anybody go there? But it's actually literally the parking lot's full all the time between the hiking and the sledding. Um, so it, it's, it, it's been good. Um, we started an annual Christmas tree lighting event uh, when they made the slide for me. I don't want to rip on anyone. I thought they'd at least give me a slide at night when you could see the lights. Um, but, you know, city staff works during the day, not at night. So. We started, the, the tree on the right, the largest one, we started with that one. Um, and then the second year, we added three more trees. Uh, the company that gave us the estimate of how many bulbs we needed said that that would cover one. It's now covered four, and we still have more. So I don't know how, how well we did on that one, but, <clears throat> but it looks really nice. And then uh, in Oak Grove, you know, a lot, what a lot of people are are uh, concerned about is they don't want to be bothered by the government and they want their taxes low. And so we do our best to try and work with all the residents to not to be you know, the government overreach and to have low taxes. So again this year we were able to have a tax rate of 19.78. 
um, which, again, we were excited about. It was tough. Um, the, the city originally wanted a 25% increase, and it just that wasn't going to work. So we got down to 19.78 for the tax rate, and we still have good services. But I was elected to the council four years ago. My goal was to have a deputy in the city 24 hours a day. At that time, we had four hours that we didn't have anyone. Um, I mean, the good news is the county car, somebody would come if you called 911. The sheriff obviously has to provide that. But uh, it took me three years to get it done, but we now have a deputy in the city 24 hours a day, which I think is good for everyone. Whether it's businesses or residents, the response times have improved. And just having that squad car drive around we're hoping would prevent crime. And the good news is in Oak Grove, we don't have a lot of crime. So that's why I live there. Well, that's it. Thank you. I'm not here, I'm not here to 10 is on deck, but first, uh, the Chamber has had a long history of working with our manufacturers, and we created a manufacturing cohort, and with us today to give you an update is the Chamber's Director of Manufacturing, John Letourneau. Thanks, Pete. Hey, good to see everybody. Uh, as Pete said, my name's John Letourneau, for those of you who do not know me. Uh, I've had the pleasure of conducting an activity supporting manufacturing now for, get it, 15 years we've been on this one. It's been a lovely ride uh, trying to really reach out and just be that connection uh, for that aspect of our business community. Um, I want to start it off with a shout out to uh, what we are calling our trusted partners. Uh, our trusted partners believe in this mission to such a degree that they are willing to invest in it. Uh, that is the funding source for how we conduct this. Ain't no money, ain't no mission. So thank you very much to our trusted partners, Connexus Energy, the city of Anoka, and also uh, Anoka Technical College. So we couldn't do it without you, and we thank you for that. Hey, looking back um, at last year, I'm more of a look through the windshield guy and not so much in the rearview mirror, but I did take a moment or two to kind of kick it around and, and take a look at what we actually did last year. It was crazy. Uh, the first part of what came back last year was the opportunity to meet in person. So we did uh, conduct in-person uh, meetings. Uh, the cohort is for manufacturing by manufacturing. And so it's driven by their activity, by their desire. It's what they want to see out of this event. So we try to get them together about six to eight times a year. Uh, any more than that, it's a little bit, uh, doesn't fit their schedule or their programming. It's almost a little too much for them. But when we come together, we tackle uh, objects or important issues that are uh, on their front burner. They usually tend to have a tendency to fall into one of three categories. The first one is workforce acquisition. Where's the next set of work for workers coming from? What's that pipeline look like? And how do we have access to them? Uh, the second one is workforce incumbent training. What are we doing uh, to upskill our current workforce, to invest in that workforce, and to maybe plan for the future around who's going to be running and, and taking over these organizations? And then the third one is continuous improvement. What things need to happen inside the organization that can create more efficiency and allow them to be more sustainable over the course of time. So those are the three areas that the manufacturers want us to talk about. Last year, we spent a lot of time, if you can imagine, wait for it, workforce acquisition. That one's driving it right now completely. And so we are doing everything we can to try to support uh, the next pipeline of workers that are coming through the system and having them be more aware of what's happening in the trades and specifically manufacturing. Last year we wrote, um, or we participated in the development and the deployment of our first Minnesota dual training pipeline grant. So the chamber went out and actually uh, put together a consortium cohort style um, system to write a grant. We were, uh, the first grant was in round 10 and that was deployed last year. That was $120,000 that we were able to use to train 20 uh, individuals at the Anoka Technical College uh, in advanced manufacturing, a level one course that took folks that are inside the industry maybe just as, as early users and brought them to a new level of skill that would allow for them to grow in their organization and build their career. We went around last year 
and took on another round of that grant. So we have two rounds of grant. The actual grant process is probably a little bit more cumbersome than any one particular employer cares to take on. But when we can do it in a cohort style, we can actually write the grant, we can provide the training providers, and we can administer all the aspects around the reporting on the grant and allow for the employer just to have the benefit of participation. That's what makes this so lovely. So our round two grant came back at the maximum level of 125,000, and we're able to tra uh, train 25 people. And we're in the midst of deploying on that again this year. Next year, we're looking at doing the same thing, and we'd like to offer the second level of training. So we're doing level one training for two years. We've got a, a pool of candidates that are now ready to take on that second level. The second level of training is, again, going to perform or prepare them for um, higher levels of uh, career growth. And it'll also move them toward a degree, which is another aspect of how continuous improvement is really important for um, an organization. So other things that we did, um, we, we do outreach and manufacturing tours. And so we interact with them and uh, with manufacturers. We bring them uh, out to the schools. We bring, them, uh, we bring the schools out to them. And we switch that back and forth. So we do quite a bit of work on that. Um, I also serve on a planning board for the first ever Minnesota Manufacturer Technical Educators Conference that was held at the Anoka Technical College in July. I serve on the new program task force for the Anoka Technical College. That's reviewing new programming that might be coming forward that'll support education of the trades. And I'm also part of the Anoka Hennepin District 11 STEAM uh, Advisory Board. Those are all aspects of how our relationship as a chamber can go deeper into the whole um, fabric of the community and allow for uh, students to have a better experience around uh, developing and designing careers. Like I said, I'm looking at um, the rear view mirror. I'm also looking at the front, uh, out the front windshield. As we're going to continue to work with dual training pipeline this year, we're also taking on a separate effort right now with the independent school district number 11, the Noka Hennepin district. And from there, we're designing a new model that's going to be what we call our world-class model of how we're going to introduce students early, maybe as early as the seventh and eighth grade, to careers in the trades. We're going to, have to follow them along a timeline, and we're going to put them on a path so that they have, during the course of their education, um, multiple opportunities to identify with careers in the trades. And there's a huge opportunity for this, and we really are excited about it. Our manufacturers are getting behind it right now, and that's one of the efforts that we're working on this year, and I'm looking forward to seeing where that takes us. And so as I end it, uh, this presentation of the time I'm spending with you, I'm trying to think of what would be the best way for me to describe what this experience is like. And so I said it's for manufacturing, it's by manufacturing. It seems to be somewhat subjective because it's hard to really totally measure everything that we're doing. But I want to share with you what I normally or I try to do at the end of one of our presentations, one of our cohorts. I will put up on the board, I'll say, please share with me one word. And the one word is the feeling that they have as they've concluded the effort that we put together for that day or whatever that meeting was. So here's an example of um, a recent cohort's uh, response to one word. Team, thought-provoking community, value, motivated, relevant, collaborative, hope, necessary, exciting, work, passion, energy, insightful, foundational, and educational. I think that says it in a word. And I'm super excited to have this opportunity to continue to deliver this for you guys. Thank you so much. That was good. All right. So, a little road construction. Um, I've been telling people this from the very beginning of the Highway 10 project. Short-term pain, long-term gain. Uh, I started at the chamber 36 years ago. Highway 10 was being discussed then about the roads. I grew up in Anoka when there was nothing on Highway 10 except lights. And now there's a whole lot of, a lot. And it's time for us. I'm so excited with the possibilities of what's going to happen when we eliminate those lights. And so be nice to these people because we've got money being spent in our region and the effect 
will be on all of our member cities, and we're excited about that. So with that, I'm going to introduce you to Kent Barnard, and he can introduce the player with him. Uh, these guys are from the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you. We appreciate the opportunity to come out here and speak to you about what has happened on Highway 10 through Anoka and what is coming up. My uh, cohort here is Cody Leisman, and he's handling business liaison efforts for this project. And I'm sure many of you have already probably met him, at least uh, in an uh, online version of him. little technology here. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the project overview, what we have accomplished in the last year, and then Cody will take over and talk about our 2023 construction impacts. We'll have a little contact information with you for you, and uh, if you need to ask any questions, we'll try to get some of those out of the way too. There have been a number of projects up in this area. Um, Ramsey project has already been discussed, the Ramsey Gateway project, so we won't dwell on that, but we've done several projects up here, including at Round Lake Boulevard, and then several years back at Hanson Boulevard. And this information is also up on our website, too. The Highway 10 Anoka project is actually two separate projects, uh, one of them which is on the west end of town from West Main Street out to Thurston was actually a city of Anoka project before uh, Mindot and Anoka did get together to decide to do these projects together. The project on the east is basically from Ferry Street, Highway 169, Highway 47, all the way out to 4th Avenue. And uh, it's been going quite well working collaboratively with the city of Anoka and with Anoka County, too. Can't forget them. Last year, we did do West Main Street, Greenhaven Road Interchange. We've got two roundabouts on either side, and we've got on-ramps and off-ramps at this location. Uh, been working fairly well. Although I will bring up that we have had some problems with people coming eastbound on Highway 10 and leaving Highway 10 a little hot to get down into the roundabout. So uh, if you know people that are using that route to get where they need to go, just remind them they got to slow down for traffic that's already in the roundabout. Um, MnDOT does have information about roundabouts on our website, and then our friends at QCTV did an excellent video that you can find that shows how to drive in a roundabout. Okay, this is also Main Street here, uh, going over uh, the Highway 10, going over Main Street on the west end of the projects, and then here is the roundabout on the south side of Highway 10 in the area. Also, the Highway 10 Rum River Bridge, we did replace the westbound bridge last year. We added an auxiliary lane to the bridge. And, of course, this year will be our chance to take down and rebuild the eastbound Rum River Bridge. Uh, just a quick sh shot showing this bridge while it was under construction. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Cody to talk us through our 2023 construction. Thank you, Kent. All right. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to put my notes down here. Um, I'll just walk through a few of the very high level changes that we're going to see this year. Um, as you're probably all aware, we already did one year of construction in 22. And this year we're going to do it again with one lane in each direction on Highway 10. Um, I know it is less ideal than some of the other projects discussed earlier today, um, but that is how it has to be. Lots of changes going on um, to the ramps as well as the bridge on Ferry Street. I'll get into that in the next slide here. Um, but you'll kind of see things changing throughout the course of the construction season. Um, local road and sidewalk closures will also um, be changing. And so this is about as high level as we could get it here. And so now we're looking at March or pretty much the, the crews are ready to go. You know, it's just when weather permits. Um, so we're not sure exactly when in March this will begin. But from March till about July, um, again, you'll be seeing those lanes go down to one lane in each direction. Uh, there are a few different weekend closures we want you to be aware of. Um, the Ferry Street bridge removal will begin um, as soon as possible, and so that'll begin in early, 
excuse me, early spring, and then that will um, be under construction the whole year. So you won't be able to use the bridge over uh, Highway 10 at Ferry Street. Uh, that will be closed. Uh, 7th Avenue, there will be one weekend closure there as well to do some railroad bridge work. Um, and then an additional closure on 7th Avenue to eastbound Highway 10 for 14 days. So that'll take us through July. Um, the fair is at the end of July, and so uh, a little bit of overlap there. But then from July into November, it's the second stage of this year's construction. Again, uh, we'll still be at one lane in each direction. Ferry Street itself will be one lane in each direction. We've been in contact with a couple of the business owners on Ferry Street about those um, closures and impacts. Ferry Street will be one lane uh, through the fall. Uh, the Highway 10, there will also be a couple overnight closures. You know, if you're driving normal hours, you probably won't be affected by these, but just uh, know if you are driving late or nobody, anyone who is, or any um, uh, shipping that may be coming in, uh, there will be a couple overnight closures to place the bridge beams and construct the Ferry Street bridge deck. And so that's the very high level. Um, if you want to learn more, we will have a public open house tomorrow at the Greenhaven Golf Course. Many heads are nodding, so I'm guessing the word's gotten out. Uh, you can also, um, if you're not in the loop, you can go to the website. I know the link here is um, kind of small on the bottom, but even if you Google Highway 10 Anoka, that'll take you to a MnDOT website. And then you can sign up for that um, email list, and that'll give you an alert every time one of these big uh, closures or ramp changes uh, and the detours are going on. Um, you'll have a chance to talk with MnDOT staff tomorrow. Uh, that'll be from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. at Greenhaven again. And then every month, starting this month and going till October, I will be hosting monthly business meetings on the fourth Thursday of each month. Um, right around the lunch hour, so 11.30 until 12.30. Uh, we'll stay till 1 if people are still around. And so you can join me um, starting next Thursday, February 23rd at 11.30 at the Anoka City Hall. Um, you can also send me an email here or give me a phone call, and I can send you the link. They are hybrid meetings, so we're having them in person and online, uh, just whatever is more convenient for you. Uh, feel free to take a picture, give me a call. I am your point of contact with MnDOT staff. I can get you connected to the project managers, even to the city if needed. Um, the city engineer, Ben, has been excellent to work with throughout this process, so kudos to him and the city of Anoka. Um, send me a phone call and an email if you have any questions about any business impacts or, or just construction impacts, and I will get back to you within a day. Um, we'll be in the back here. I, I have a couple business cards if you want, and. Uh, let us know if you have any questions. So, thank you very much. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. MnDOT's been great to work with. You know, our job at the chamber is to just get the word out to all of you. And anytime a road gets shut down or something happens, our phones explode. And, and it didn't happen for Highway 10 like we thought it would. I think for a couple of reasons. Number one, this has been talked about for a long time. Number two, I think everybody's ready for it. Number three, MnDOT's done a great job. I love having a hotline number to say, well, yes, ma'am, here's a number you can call. Um, and to have the website, they've done a great job with that. Well, I'll tell you what I've learned from today is, is that things are popping in this region, and I'm not surprised. Special thank you to our luncheon sponsor, Chris Randall and the crew at First Bank Elk River and the crew at Kilbury Root Beer. Thank you to Tammy Went, who gets to come to this event and time people. Yeah, that's how I want to spend my Valentine's lunch. Um, our next event is going to be a different event in the sense that we're going to have Chamber Night with the Minnesota Twins. On Tuesday, May 9th, they're playing the Padres, and we are going to bring something back that we haven't done in, in 20 years. You will uh, hear about it through the Chamber newsletters and some Monday morning emails I'll be sending out, but we're going to grab a batch of tickets along the the uh, first base side of Target Field for that 640 game, and I hope you'll consider maybe bringing some employees and attending yourself. With that said, um, to all of our cities, to our elected officials, to our mayors, to our city council members, to city staff, uh, you guys are rock stars. I know what you go through. Um, I know that it's not all glamour and uh, wonderful, happy, joy, joy. I know that you deal with stuff. And we appreciate all of you and what you do. 
we feel like we're a partner with you. Look, we're getting that phone call, and we've got people that are interested in coming to this area, whether it be business and commercial, or whether it be residential. We hold on tight, not like a creepy uncle type, but we hold on tight, and we try to help them make the decision to come to our area and taking nothing away from Burnsville, but we want everybody to live in our member communities. We want them to work here and we want them to do business here. And you city people help make all of that happen and we appreciate your efforts and everything that you do. And with that said, on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Enoch Area Chamber, hey, thanks for coming to our annual State of the Cities lunch. And don't forget, Kent and Cody, will you take some questions if people have some questions on the project? They nodded yes, so go get them, Tiger. Thank you very much for attending.